universities. I see that they're allowed now to charge higher rates for their, their degrees. That's great, I suppose. That'll make them more open to the market. Give students, I don't know, a better choice perhaps. Joe Hockey even went as far to say that some universities might charge less for their degrees in the near future. But there was talk also of having loans up front from the government to students. Now, I don't know if these go on top of HECS or not, but I can tell you, if you think it's hard to buy a house now as someone in their early, in their early 20s, it's only going to get harder. You'll have HECS and possibly a loan from the federal government to pay for a degree that just might not even get you a job these days. Now, the penultimate thing I want to look at, and Alan mentioned this, is hypothecation. It's a Greek word. I had to look it up last night. It said it, it, on Wikipedia, which you actually can't trust, it says it means the dedication of revenue from a specific tax for a particular expenditure purpose. In plain English, it's a bit like a household budget for battling Australians, where money is put in different jam jars. You know, one has rent written on it, one has groceries, one has petrol, you know, one might have school expenses and so on. And money is put in so that you know, the, the, the wage that comes in each week, or maybe the two wages, isn't frittered away on unnecessary things. That's sort of what the federal government is doing here. Now, I was always taught a long time ago when I did economics <clears throat> that, you know, all government revenue basically goes into one big bucket. So there's a big bucket, all the money goes in, and there's lots of holes in the bottom of the bucket, and the money just pours out. And I, I, and I've always liked that, and you've got to keep filling the bucket up, you know, because otherwise the, the water will run out too quickly, or the money will run out too quickly, and that sort of is, is the way I think of the budget. But hypothecation sort of says that there's, you know, there's lots of little buckets with different names on them. And last night we learnt, even though to me this sounds stupid, that that's what the government intends to do. So we've got the re-indexation of the fuel excise. Now John Howard panicked back in 2001 because petrol went through, shock horror, $1 a litre. And he actually cut the excise by one and a half cents to its present and not very round number of 38.143 cents a litre. But he also stopped the automatic indexation. So if you're a beer drinker at your local pub, you know that every six months, you know, the cost of beer goes up by a few cents. That's just the excise on alcohol being adjusted for the rate of inflation. Had John Howard not done that, petrol would be between 20 and 22 cents a litre more expensive these days. So the indexation is back, and I think it makes sense. It's a bit like sticking a frog in a bucket of water and then turning up the temperature or a saucepan of water. You know, the frog doesn't realise until it's too late that the water is boiling and the frog is now dead. That's what indexation is like. It's a creeping tax, but it's very, very effective for the government. But what I don't understand is, having made this politically difficult revenue uh, decision last night, it's now all going into a fund to build roads. Now, the whole link between petrol taxes and roads is that there isn't one. I'm a member of the RACV, like many Victorians are. The RACV constantly bangs on about how petrol taxes are up here and road funding is down here and the two need to meet each other. The point is, if we had hypothecation for everything, there wouldn't be any revenue for welfare, for example. But for some reason, I just don't understand this, suddenly the federal government really wants to get into the roads business. And if you know, automotive taxes equal road building, well, how do local councils pay for their roads? They actually fix more roads than the federal government does. They don't have automotive taxes unless you count parking permits. How does the state government fix roads? It also does that too. Again, they don't have a petrol excise they can whack on the top. So this version of hypothecation to me doesn't make very much sense. And then there's the $7 GP co-payment fee to stop the malingerers and the pensioners who have nothing better to do other than to chat to the nice young doctor <laughs> to keep them away. And I thought, well, you know, it'll probably just push people into emergency rooms, so it'll just shuffle the problem around. But we'll see what happens there. But I was really surprised last night that this, this revenue stream, this new revenue stream, is also going to be subject to hypothecation. Will it go into reducing debt? No, it won't, notwithstanding the fact that the debt crisis is the crisis of our age. Instead, it's going into a $20 billion medical research fund. Now, it'll take several years for the $20 billion to be reached. And I don't know about you, but when I heard this, alarm bells started going off in my ears. Now, the Future Fund is just a, 
a fund like that. It has a hypothecated purpose, at least for a while. It's there to fund the unfunded liabilities on uh, public service uh, pension payments in the future. So, you know, judges and military members and, and politicians and so forth. That's okay, because we know that that liability already existed for the federal government. But a $20 billion medical research fund, I mean, does any of us really trust the government to be out there saying that this bionic eye device that you have shown us is the thing that we will throw public money at, but that artificial heart is not? And I'm just making these things up, that this compound that might cure a disease is worthy of funding, but that one is not? I'm sure they'll have all sorts of worthy people and whatever who advise the government on where the money should be spent. But generally speaking, and Joe Hockey has said this, governments should not and could not really just should stay away from trying to pick winners. Now, to regale you with just the last bit of history, or the second last bit of history for today, I remember back in the late 80s and early 90s that we had a thing here in Victoria called the Victorian Equity Development Corporation. And back then, the, uh, the Kane and Kerner governments were very concerned about the disappearance of smokestack industries, like car making, for example, in a so-called Rust Belt state here in Victoria. So they formed the Victorian Equity Development Corporation to fund new and exciting businesses. For example, there was wild women's surfboards to make surfboards that only women could ride. The amazing thing was they looked just like the ones the men rode, but they were a different colour. Guess what? The business didn't work. I believe there was a type of abattoir that was possibly ahead of its time, was going to be halal only, but back then there weren't enough Muslims, it didn't work. The point is, is the VEDC was a disaster because it was state government politicians and bureaucrats trying to pick investments. What makes us think that a $20 billion medical research fund will be any better? I have a real fear that this $7 co-payment fee that will cause a lot of pensioners and so forth a fair bit of distress, that that money could be wasted. I'd rather they just used it to pay down debt. Why repeat this hypothecated experiment? It doesn't make any sense. Now, last year at this breakfast, I gave you a movie analogy for the, um, the budget. I liken, Wayne, as it turns out, Wayne Swan's last budget to Soylent Green. I'm a big fan of the work of Charlton Heston in the late 60s and early 70s in the sci-fi world. He gave us Planet of the Apes. He gave us Soylent Green. Um, he, he, he gave us the Omega Man about the last uninfected man on Earth. These were very dystopian views of the future. And in Soylent Green, for those of you who haven't seen it, the world's food supply is running out and old people are encouraged to kill themselves to be turned into food for everybody else. So it wasn't a good look. This year, the movie I picked, and I'll go back to the mid-90s, is Robert De Niro and Dustin Hoffman in Wag the Dog. In that movie, a fictional war in the Balkans, as it turned out, just before there was a real Balkans war, was, um, was sort of put in place. It didn't actually exist, but it took uh, attention off a struggling president. I reckon Wag the Dog is a good analogy for what we're going through at the moment. If we have this massive debt crisis, and we've been told this through all the cliches that I mentioned earlier on in my, in my speech, if we have that, then I would have thought last night's budget should have done a lot, lot more to try and address it. Instead, a la Wag the Dog, what we do have is tinkering at the edges. Thank you very much.